What's up everyone, Cheetah here, and today I'm bringing you an achievement slash platinum trophy walkthrough for Life of Fly 2. This game is published and developed by Pixar Games, and you can pick it up today for a price of $9.99. And to get the full completion, it will take you a little over an hour. So this is a, another flying storytelling game, and it's super easy and relaxing. You just fly around and pick up some collectibles and listen to the story. So it's super easy, and you shouldn't have any issues. I went ahead and practiced all of the uh, levels and learn the fastest routes to help you guys finish the game as quickly as possible. And sadly, I chose not a to do commentary throughout the video this time good. around, but don't worry, awesome. you fly really slow and it's super easy to follow along with even without the commentary. I was actually late to uh, uploading this since they had a broken achievement, but now it's fixed and you should be able to unlock everything no problem. I'm also gonna have timestamps to each of the uh, different levels if you're just looking for a specific one, but that's gonna do it for the uh, commentary guys. I'll let you enjoy the story now. So thank you guys for watching. Leave a like on the video if it was helpful and please consider subscribing if you haven't already and enjoy the guide. Leonard had decided to read every book in the library, a Herculean task, but one he decided was the best way to learn. He spent his days buzzing from one open book to the next, studying words about why we were here, why he was here. When I met him, he regaled tales of storytellers long since gone and forgotten. He told me about wondrous foods, about the tallest mountains and the deepest seas, As an exchange, I told him of my travels and other flies I had met on my journeys. We picked out an old sandwich and shared laughs. These were good times, but I had to leave. While he urged me to stay with him, I couldn't. Unlike Leonard, I needed to explore and move on with my life. As the sun set on the library and the lights were going out, Leonard hadn't noticed the dark shadow that crept in through an open window. Against the crimson sky, a black cat slinked from shelf to shelf, its shadow eventually blending in with the rest of its surroundings. I had returned to the library to ask Leonard one last time to join me on my travels. too late. In an instant, the shadow leapt down from the shelf above Leonard and snuffed out his life. The great philosopher was gone. The cat was fed and left once more through the window.
Leonard spent his life looking up the answers to life instead of living it. experience the things he had read so earnestly about. Love. Love is beautiful and weird, isn't it? As a fly, I've wondered about love for a long time. I mean, I am supposed to find love out there. Am I supposed to love another fly? I know that I should find a mate, but that doesn't mean that I will love them. But I do like to watch humans and how they express love, or in some cases how they can outright reject it. Love can be an all-consuming emotion that influences every part of their lives, or just a passive feeling. The humans don't just have a single type of love. Instead, it depends on who they love and at what stage they are in life. For example, humans can love their family, their friends, and for lack of a better word, their lovers. And their children, of course. Humans seem to love those little pink screaming sacks of mucus. But as with many things in life, love is a gamble. It's impossible to say who you'll spend your life with who you'll meet tomorrow, and who you'll never want to speak to. I've seen humans fall head over heels in love with someone and devote our every waking moment to them constantly showering each other with gifts and praise. But over time, that love can fade away, leaving nothing but resentment and hatred. You can see the person you love for every day of a decade, and then never want to speak to them ever again.
and depending on how intertwined their lives are, they might need something called a lawyer? It all seems just very messy to me. It's not all doom and gloom. Far from it. The humans seem to be able to form lifelong bonds with each other that enrich their lives. The human capacity for love is unfathomable. They shower each other with hugs and kisses, or just simple handshakes. It can even just be the nod of a head. There's even love that's unspoken between two humans. They'll never admit it, but it's there. It's beautiful, that's for sure. But if there's one consistent that I've seen, it's the human's love of animals. Humans seem to have unconditional love for dogs, cats, birds, but never flies. As a fly, I know that my purpose is to eat and to breed, and sometimes I have existential thoughts. But humans, they've got existing down to a fine art. So many of them don't worry about their short lifespans. What are we having for dinner? Do you think I look good in these? I don't know if Emily will call me. There are just some of the things I hear humans say while waiting for their laundry to finish. But they don't say these things to each other. Instead, humans talk into small objects they hold to their hands. I see their thumbs furiously swiping up and down while they ignore the person next to them. What strange mundane lives these humans lead? I find it fascinating how technology has changed the way that the world handles business. A few decades ago, salespeople had to canvas areas and go door to door to drum up business. It was a time consuming process.
Can you imagine doing that now? Would you be able to walk up to someone's office door and ask them to trust you with their business needs? Once business directories were more commonplace, a lot of personal visits were replaced with phone calls. Phone calls are still commonplace, mind you. These days, it's all about having potential customers find you on social media. experts to handle all of the different channels, marketing methods, and strategy. I sound like an advert, don't I? persona may be relatable, but it may not be personable. While this has vastly improved the efficiency of obtaining new customers, businesses have somewhat lost their personal touch when it comes to dealing with customers. How often have you contacted a company and spoken with a computer bot instead of a human? A lot, I presume. I mean, everyone has unique problems and questions that a bot might not be able to answer. How do you explain your wants, needs, and expectations to a computer that has no empathy? Some very smart people are constantly improving digital assistance, but it's still easy to tell when you're talking to a person or not. There's a lot in the digital world that is moving away from personal interactions and emotions. It's a shame, really. Again, I'm a fly, so I can't use the phone or a computer, but I hear humans grumble about it a lot. Isn't it weird that people have entire rooms dedicated to being clean, but some of them lack basic hygiene? There are circumstances that may prevent you from accessing running water or healthcare products, but this is about the people who do have those things. Some people just might not wash their hands properly or ignore bathing for days on end. I've seen a lot of people get sick from not following basic hygiene. And have you seen the way that these folk treat shared facilities? The amount of excrement on the floor of a bathroom is astounding. Don't get me started on the amount of sweat they leave all over the gym equipment.
But it's always someone else's problem to clean it up, I guess. I might be a fly, but humans are pretty gross. If I'm real, zooming around this room, eating pieces of raw food, watching as the people come and go. Is this existence? Is it even possible to prove that you're real and you're in control of your own life? Before ending up here, I once traveled to a library in another part of the building. I'm sure the library was real. Wasn't it? Anyways, the fly said to me, I think, therefore I am. According to him, because he doubted his own existence, he proved that he was real. I guess that's one way to look at things. I've said the same thing over and over to myself, maybe a hundred times, but it never puts my mind at ease. I guess now that I'm thinking about it, I'm proving my own existence? It gives me a headache. But what if I'm not real? Then why am I even here? If this was some sort of dream, or an existence created by another's thought, then surely it would be a better life for me. I wouldn't need to look for life or companionship or even meaning. I'd just have everything easy. My life would be a breeze. But if life wasn't hard, would it be worth living at all? Have you ever had a dream where you can't wake up no matter how hard you try? Sometimes, I think those are real, and this, now, is all a dream. It's a bit crazy, I know, but so is being a fly. Fly, flying around a big, dark room filled with chairs and a large screen and pondering their existence. Seems kind of artificial, doesn't it? Why do humans have heroes? To me, the word hero conjures up images of firefighters or medical workers. But for humans, it goes beyond that. 
because they revere people who might be a bit smarter or stronger than them. I mean, humans even worship those who are popular or have more money than them. Even taking a vapid picture can have you worship. Should you really think better of someone who owns nicer things than you do? Did those people change the course of humanity in a positive way or bring on great change? It's incredibly strange. We flies, we revere great storytellers and those who can pass on vast amounts of information. But I digress. Hero worship must be part of the human's aging process. I've seen them change who they worship depending on where they are in their lives. Kids almost always think of the adults around them as heroes. And to a child, adults look like titans who can do no real wrong and have the world figured out. This doesn't include fictional heroes who fight supervillains. Do flies have superheroes? Do we have supervillains? Inevitably, the day comes when children realize that adults are flawed. They're just regular people with regular people problems. But humans don't learn from those experiences and keep hero worshiping other humans. They idolize those in positions of power, athletes, and the wealthy like they're gods, but they're just people. When those demi-hero humans eventually fall from the public's grace, they are shunned. The humans act as if they are above whatever transgression has transpired. But they are the ones who worship them as heroes. What a strange bunch of creatures. I wonder if there is another me out there somewhere. What I mean is, I wonder if there is another version of me who made different choices in their life. Is there another me that lived in a library or a pantry or a subway station? Could they have been born in the countryside, or near the Arctic? Did the other me find love, settle down, and have kids? What if this other me is already dead, eaten by a cat, or squashed by a fly swatter? If that's the case, did anyone mourn their death? What if our choices in life are predefined and I am all there is? That's a pretty scary thought. Have you ever experienced deja vu? It's the feeling that you've already experienced a moment in time, but you know you haven't. You'll often feel a tingling on the back of your neck and think, Hey, I've done this before, but when? Some people think of it as a premonition of the future. It's just one way the universe is telling you that you're on the right path in life.
Others view it as the thoughts of ourselves from alternate realities. That we've made the same choice in life at this moment in time, and our consciousnesses are somehow running parallel to each other. Like slipping into someone else's body for a split second. It may not be something we'll ever be able to prove. How do you even prove that there's another world out there beyond what we can see, let alone one where other versions of us made different life choices? If there is another me out there somewhere, I hope they're happy. I hope they got to see the world and live out their dreams. Have you ever heard the story of the Farmer King and the Starving Kingdom? He wasn't born into nobility, but started life as a simple farmer. One night, during a heavy storm and after a heavy bout of merriment, the farmer awoke to the sounds of heavy knocking and shouting at his door. In his drunken haze, the farmer snuck up on the man and ended his life. As it turns out, the man was the great king of the land. His horses and carriage had been swept into a nearby river while he barely managed to survive. He had stumbled upon the farmer's house while seeking shelter for the night. By the laws of the kingdom, the farmer was now king. He inherited a land full of wealth and prosperity, built on the backs of people who love the great king.
Fearing that he would lose his newfound power, the farmer king planned a campaign against neighboring kingdoms. With the help of the Great King's generals, the Farmer King conquered new lands. But the conquests came with a heavy price. The farmer king could not see the plague, a sickness that slowly turned crops to dust. His people, however, understood they had to change the king's mind or suffer under his rule. Ignoring his subjects' calls for peace, the farmer king feared an insurrection. He ordered that every person who spoke a single word against him be slain, and soon his kingdom crumbled and his resources diminished. The people hungered, the people grew desperate. One night, during a heavy storm and after a bout of merriment, the Farmer King finally realized how empty his throne room truly was. On the far side of the room hung a portrait of the Great King. The Farmer King lunged a knife into the painting, shouting and screaming at it cursing the great king's name. As he did, his people stormed the castle. They emptied the kitchens, the pantries, and the stables. In their desperate hunger, the subjects added the Farmer King to their feast. At long last their bellies were full, and the tyrant was no more.
Paranoia and greed killed the king who wasn't fit for his power. I want to travel the world, see the snow-capped mountains of Everest, the Incan city of Machu Picchu, a sunset over the Serengeti. There are so many beautiful places in this world, both natural and human-made. Oh, and then there's food. I want to try as many different dishes as possible. I've heard there's a fruit that smells worse than anything you've ever smelled, but tastes oh so sweet. And there's canned fish that has to be opened underwater. That's incredible. I'll settle for just seeing the rest of the neighborhood. I want to experience it all, but I just can't. No matter what, I can't seem to leave this station. I've spent my life trying to find a way out, but I haven't found the exit. The train tunnels don't lead anywhere. They're just impassable darkness. The train doors never open for me. When people get on and off the trains, they always push me out of the way. There are steps that people use to enter and exit the station, but when I approach, they're just locked doors. And the manholes are too heavy for me to lift. I think they're welded shut. Other flies come and go. I've had so many conversations with them, so I know they're real. But they always vanish during the night and never come back. To be honest, I don't really remember a lot about them. This station is weird, and it's strange. Sometimes, it's almost too quiet, and too dark, even with everything else going on around me. The only real memory I have of arriving here is from a long time ago. I remember sitting on the ground when a large boot almost squashed me. shot out of the way at the last second, I think, but that's about it. One day, I'll finally leave this place. Why is there so much hate in the human world? Humans hate each other over such strange things. I've heard stories of humans killing each other over the way they look, or even where they were born. No one can control the mass of land they were given life on, or the pigment of their skin. It just doesn't make any sense. I like to think it's due to jealousy. The humans hate each other because they envy what others have. Humans even start wars in the name of their religions.
Just imagine following a specific philosophy in life and then hating someone because they don't believe in the same thing that you do. But hate can also exist on a smaller scale, one that doesn't involve entire nations. I've seen humans hate each other because of failed relationships. And sometimes, their mutual friends will pick sides during the breakup and never speak to each other again. Break bread today and hate tomorrow. On some level, hate is a natural emotion, like love and joy. It's a way to help you cope with the events going on around you. It's something to make you feel better. You might hate someone because they cut you off in traffic or took the last chocolate muffin. They had no right to do that, right? That kind of hate doesn't always hang around for long and will dissipate. There are people who hate for enjoyment. They delight in the fact that they can take away someone else's happiness the thing that gives them meaning in life, or even their rights. Why would you not want to see someone else enjoy life? The lifespan of a human is far too short for the constant hatred of others. If you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. How often have you heard someone say that? Better yet, how often have you actually seen that in action? How many people do you know who absolutely love what they do for a living and don't consider it to be work? I'm assuming the answer is very few, if any. When we're young, we dream of being astronauts or firemen or lawyers. We see these careers glorified in different forms of media that shape our young lives. I wanted to be a paleontologist, you know, jetting off to exotic locations and digging up dinosaur bones. It was all I could talk about when I was a kid. But life isn't that glamorous. We eventually realize just how unrealistic some of those jobs are. How many astronauts do you know? How many flies do you know who dig up old bones? Yeah, me neither. Still, I wanted something more out of life. I wanted an outlet for all of my thoughts and emotions. So I ended up here, in an office, the dull hum of fluorescent lights illuminating every part of my day with incessant ringing of phones. Do you know what it's like to sit in meeting after meeting and watch the hours drift away? I'm sure you do. 
I'm sure most of you do. After years of staring at a clinically clean white wall of posters that subdue instead of inspire, I'd had enough. Every night I worked as hard as I could to let my creativity flow. The freedom to create a work of art that you pour your heart and soul into is truly a satisfying experience. But that doesn't mean it was enough to leave the office. The modern world shackles us to our desk because there are bills to pay. It's just a pity that so many feel as though a working life can't be a creative life. And it's a tragedy that we are conditioned into thinking this way. We have so much to give and so little time to do it. I wish we all knew that. I wish we could create and let our imaginations run wild. I wish I could leave this place. We all die. It's just a fact. There are only two certainties in life. You're born and you die. It's scary, you know, thinking about a time when you'll no longer be around. Does everything just go black? Do you know that you're dead? Are we instantly born again or never given another chance? It doesn't matter if you believe in religion because, at some point, the you of right now in this life will cease to exist. Is it some sort of cosmic cruel joke that we're alive for a finite amount of time? But I don't know what's worse, the thought of me dying, or the thought of someone I love dying.
When someone you know passes away, they're always taken too soon, even if they've lived the fullest of lives. You have to go through stages of grieving. You need to accept that you'll never see that person again. You'll never hear them again. You'll never hold them. Once enough time passes, will you even remember their smell? I've met a lot of flies along my travels, but I can't say for sure which ones have passed on. As flies, you usually meet each other once, share stories, and then go your separate ways. And just the thought of one of those flies being pounced on by a cat or squashed with a fly swatter is awful. In those final moments, did they find any comfort? Did they finally discover the meaning of life, only to have it ripped away? I cannot bear the thought of one of those flies being killed in some awful way, and then still dealing with the physical pain as they pass away, alone. I guess death really is some sort of cruel cosmic joke. We don't know when we're going to die. It could happen at any moment. All we can do is try to leave good memories for others around us, even if we may never see them again. Our lives may be finite, but death is infinite.